Hi everyone, welcome to this module on object storage uh, capabilities. In this module, we will look into various advanced features such as pre-authenticated request, cross-region copy, multi-part upload, etc. So let's first start with managing access and authentication. In the previous uh, demo, uh, we uploaded an object to a standard bucket and we were able to retrieve the object uh, uh, by changing the access level from, from private to public. So let's look at uh, some of the other things we can do with uh, objects in the OCI objects storage service. So pre-authenticated request is a way to let users access a bucket or an object without having their own uh, credentials. So as you can see here, creating a pre-authenticated request is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can create a pre-authenticated request either on the bucket or on the object and you can have a variety of options whether you just want reads on the object, uh, writes on the object or read and write both, right? And we'll actually go and show this in a, in a quick demo. Once you create a pre-authenticated request, uh, users can access the object. Let's say you're creating this for object using a URL like the one shown here. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is sort of a URL and this portion gets appended to the URL uh, and that shows that it's a pre-authenticated request. And you can see the prefix here, slash P. Uh, if you remember from the previous module, slash N is the namespace, slash B is the bucket, slash O is the object, and slash P here shows that this URL, uh, this object is being accessed using a pre-authenticated uh, request. Uh, you can revoke the links at any time. So suppose you give users access to uh, a bucket or an object without having their own credentials. Uh, and their their job is done. You can always revoke the links, and they will have they 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 will lose the access to the object of the bucket uh, going forward. Now we looked into this uh, a little bit in the previous uh, demo as well uh, uh, on on the concept of public buckets. So when you create a bucket, uh, a bucket at time of creation is considered private, and access to the bucket requires uh, authentication and authorization. We upload we created a bucket. We uploaded an object. And then we could not access the object, right? Because it said the bucket doesn't exist, or you don't have access uh, to you don't you're not authorized for the to the bucket. You don't have access to the bucket. So uh, that's the behavior when uh, when you create a bucket. Um, but when you you have an option to change that and have your users uh, access the bucket and the objects using anonymous and unauthenticated access, uh, so they don't have to be uh, authenticated. They don't have to have any kind of authorization like policies to be written or anything. They can just go and in an anonymous fashion, uh, they can they can uh, read the contents of that bucket. When you do that, that, again, the thing to keep in mind, it can be a security nightmare. You have been seeing some of these reports in the press. So unless you have a really a need, uh, you should not change the visibility of a bucket from private to public. And also thing to keep in mind that changing the type of access doesn't affect existing pre-authenticated uh, request. So if you have an existing pre-authenticated request, it will still work. So if you go from a private bucket to a public bucket, um, public will give access, unauthenticated anonymous access. But if you have given your pre-authenticated request to, to users, they can still use it and it will still, still work uh, fine. So let me quickly uh, jump to the console. And uh, before I talk about the next feature, show a pre-authenticated request in action. So we were in the object storage uh, part of the OCI console, and uh, we had uh, created two buckets, archive bucket, which is for archival long-term retention and backup. And then we had test bucket, which was a standard tier uh, bucket. Now, right now you can see it's, it's private. So if I want to access this uh, object, if I want to access this particular object, which we uploaded in the previous uh, demo, you can see that it gives me an error saying the bucket doesn't exist. We know bucket exists uh, or you're not authorized to access it. So we don't have authorization, right? That's the reason we are not able to uh, access it because it's in a, it's in a private bucket and the, it doesn't allow for anonymous unauthenticated access. So what we could do here is create a pre-authenticated request. So if I come here, I say pre-authenticated request, that name is fine, the default name I picked up. I could create it at the bucket level or I could create it at the object level. So if I want to go more granular, I could do it at the object level. And now I can also say what kind of access I want, whether it's read, write, or read and write both. Read is fine. And then I can also choose the, the time till which uh, this link will be valid. 
uh, and you have to choose this time. You cannot just do um, create a pre-authenticated request uh, for uh, you know for infinite amount of time. You have to have a time-bound uh, access, right? So by default, it picks a week uh, weeks worth of time, but you could go even longer. So a week is fine. And I create this pre-authenticated request. And now I need to copy this uh, this link because it goes away after that, uh, and it's not shown again because for security reasons, right? So I copy this. And if I go back to my uh, link I had earlier and I paste this new link now and you can see the uh, the, the part where the pre-authenticated request uh, comes in with this slash P, everything which follows after that, that shows that this uh, this object is now being accessed using a pre-authenticated request. So th there you go, right? I can see my, uh, you know, my, uh, my object here, uh, the Mount Rainier uh, picture I had uploaded earlier, right? So uh, the pre-authenticated request you have created are available right here. I can come here, I can uh, I can delete it, right? If I don't want it anymore, it's as simple as I, I would delete it. And if I delete this one and go back to my link earlier, if my users have it and they try to bring it up, you you can see that it will not work, right? Because it's 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 gone. Uh, so it's as simple as as that. Uh, if you change your uh, it's it's pretty straightforward to create a pre-authenticated request on the bucket. So the way you would do that is if you click on on the buckets here, you have you have an option to create a pre-authenticated request on the bucket itself, right? And similar to the object, if you do this, now you get this URL and you can list objects in your in your bucket if you bring if you use this uh, this URL, right? And you could do certain operations using this this URL. So hopefully it gives you a quick uh, overview of how uh, pre-authenticated requests uh, work. Let's talk about the second uh, feature, which is sort of this advanced feature on cross-region uh, copy. So one of the key requirements uh, for object storage is to cross, uh, is to copy objects to other buckets uh, in, the, in the same region and to buckets in other regions, right? So the use cases can be, you're taking a backup uh, and you have a DR situation where you want to create um, your database from that backup in another region uh, or or you know or you want to create a compute instance from 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 a custom image you have in another region so for those kind of uh, scenarios you need to copy your objects from one region to another region right because object storage is a regional service so you have access within the region but not outside the region so this feature lets you do that so creating this is really straightforward uh, you provide, of course, the namespace is, is the unique identifier you have. So you provide the namespace. You provide the destination region uh, where you want to copy your objects. You have to provide a destination bucket. Uh, and then, very important, one thing you have to keep in mind is, uh, and, and then the copy happens. But very one thing very important you have to keep in mind is you must authorize the service to manage objects on your behalf. So you have to write a policy for every region, this is the home region where you are, where you are copying from. Uh, otherwise, the cross-region copy doesn't work. So you can see here, uh, there is a policy. If you don't write this policy, uh, cross-region uh, copy probably would is is uh, the cross-region copy is not going to work. Uh, and so, uh, and you also need to specify an existing target bucket. If you don't do that, uh, it it will not let you uh, do the copy. Uh, and today, the restriction is around bulk copying is not supported. So it's a little bit tedious where you have to copy one by one. It's on the roadmap where you would be able to take lots of objects uh, and then just copy them in the same region or copy them to another region. Uh, so that feature is, is on the roadmap uh, in the next few months. So let me quickly, uh, and the last thing here is objects cannot be copied from archive storage, right? Because archive again, as we looked into uh, in the previous module uh, is you cannot change the tier from standard to archive and vice versa, right? So you this feature is only applicable today for standard. Uh, you cannot use this for archive. There's also like a four hour minimum restored period there. So you cannot do cross region copy using archive storage. So first things first, uh, I'm in Ashburn region. Let me go to Phoenix and create a bucket there, right? So we will copy our objects uh, to Phoenix, uh, uh, Phoenix region, right? Uh, I'm in the same compartment. The default name, uh, let me just call it a test bucket or something. Uh, and it's a standard tier. If I do archive, I copy will not be supported. And I just create a bucket here, right? Now, this bucket is right now empty. There is nothing inside here. So let me switch back to Ashburn. And I have a test bucket here. 
uh, and I can uh, I can actually copy this object, right? Copying is really straightforward. I say click copy. I pick my uh, my uh, destination region. It can be the same region. It can be another region. That's fine. And the bucket I just created is called test, right? So I'll just do that. And then it has various values here uh, where I can where various options here. So I could choose to overwrite destination object if the destination object exists. I could choose not to overwrite. Uh, if I, I could choose to overwrite only if it matches the specified entity tag, the e tag, and e tag matching rules allow you to control the copying or overwriting based on their e tag uh, values. Uh, so I could do that uh, and some other options, right? So let me just copy this object right now. And you would see that uh, sort of this kicks off this asynchronous process in the background where, uh, you know, this, this, this happens, right? And if I, uh, Close. If I view my work request here, you can see that my uh, my object uh, has been copied. So if I go back to uh, if I go to Phoenix region and click on test bucket, you can see that I have an object here which is existing. All right. So let's switch back to the slides and talk about another uh, key capability, uh, which is around object lifecycle management. So uh, object lifecycle management defines, you can define lifecycle rules to automatically archive or delete objects after a specified number of days. Now, as we saw in the, in, in, in the cross-region copy, you have to authorize the service to manage objects on your behalf. So you have to write a policy, otherwise uh, this thing doesn't work. And it's pretty straightforward to create a lifecycle rule. You can create a rule like this, uh, and then uh, you can apply the rule at the bucket level or the object name prefix level. If no prefix is specified, the rule will apply to all the objects in the bucket. So what do we mean by that? If you see here, we have a couple of objects and they all have a prefix, which is this thing here. Uh, so for 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 if you don't want the if you don't want this lifecycle management rule to apply to uh, at the bucket level, you could actually apply it at the at the prefix level. And in this case. The prefix is gloves27. So you could use this kind of prefix to uh, to apply apply a rule. Otherwise, you can apply the rule to, to all the objects in, in the bucket. A rule that deletes uh, an object uh, uh, always takes priority or a rule that would archive the same object. Uh, and you can always enable or disable a rule to make it inactive or active, right? So it's pretty straightforward. So let me just quickly jump to the console and show this in action. So if I go back to my uh, console, I have the standard bucket here. I have an object here, right? So so to create a lifecycle policy rules, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come down to this link here and create a rule here. And it says, okay, what is the rule that picks up on default name? And what do I want to do as an action? Do I want to delete the object or do I want to archive the object? So, you know, I'm saying archive is fine and uh, delete delete is fine. Let me just pick delete. And how many days do I need to keep it before I delete. So 30 days is fine. And then enabled or disabled. Right now, of course, I'm creating the rule. So it's enabled. And now the policy is in place, right? And so the object will be deleted uh, after uh, 30 days. Now, I didn't apply any filter in specific here, right? Like the prefix. If I had done that, I could pick and choose uh, individual objects. I don't have to do it for all the objects, right? Um, if I don't want this rule to apply anymore, I could just disable it instead of deleting it, right? So then now it's disabled but it's still in the history, so I can get some more information here. So it's as simple as that, uh, and it's really uh, for managing the cost, managing your objects, because you'll be managing you know, literally hundreds of objects, right? So it's, it's, it's a good way to uh, manage the life cycle uh, of various objects in various stages, whether you want to delete them to save some cost or move them to archival storage uh, to, again, to, to reduce the cost and keep them for long-term backup and retention. Last feature we are going to look into is um, uh, multi-part upload. Multi-part upload, uh, with multi-part upload, individual parts of an object can be uploaded in parallel to reduce the amount of time you spend uh, up uploading. In fact, uh, in yesterday's, uh, I was recording this other uh, compute section and I was uploading a custom image, which was two, uh, two gig in size. Uh, that's, fairly good size i mean of course it's not the the, the we support objects uh, up to 10 terabytes so it's not in, in in that perspective it's not that big but it's still fairly uh, large file 
So when you do upload a file like like a two terabyte file, uh, a two gigabyte file, or 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 even something smaller than that, you would see that the service itself uses multi-part upload uh, behind the scenes. You don't see that uh, in 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 action, uh, but the service is actually doing that. Now you would you could do that. Uh, you could use multi-part upload using CLI uh, or uh, SDK. Uh, the way it happens is you create first thing you do is you create uh, object parts so uh, you can you, you can see some numbers here individual parts can be as large as 50 gig or as small as as uh, as 10 mb right uh, so you could you, you you could do that using the cli cli does that for you and it assigns a part number then it initiates an upload and you can see the api call it makes to up, to initiate an upload then it uploads the object part uh, and make sure that you know all the parts are uploaded if you know you can restart a failed upload for an individual part etc and then you commit uh, the upload and i just want to quickly show you the documentation uh, if you see there is the the web page here because i uh, i'm not showing this demo right now but you can see all the parts listed here initiate the upload uh, upload the parts and then commit the upload site right? and there is a nice example here um, and scroll down there's a nice example here uh, which shows this in action using the cli so i'm uploading this this file it has I think 12 parts and you can see that the the, the part size etc the the count uh, it, you know it shows here and it's splitting the file into 12 parts for upload and then it's uh, uploading the file you can list uh, the parts of unfinished or failed uh, uploads if there are you know parts which fail to upload uh, and then you can remove them also right if there were parts which were which could not be uh, uploaded so the service takes care of breaking the the files uploading them committing them doing the checksums making sure that you know it's it's it's, it's all good uh, and as i said if you are uploading some large files uh, the service actually does this internally and but you could as as an end user you could do this as well so hopefully this module gave gave you a good overview of the four features uh, we talked about a pre authenticated request cross region copy object lifecycle management and multi part upload Thank you for watching this uh, module. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.